Amen. Praise the Lord. It is finished. Glorious words for those that know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. It sure is a privilege for me to be able to open God's Word and certainly praying that it will be a blessing to you. And I would invite you to take your Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as you already heard from Pastor Matt's report, uh, Pastor Sullivan had his messages and uh, the services all prepared and as I said, I know he would love to be here and we'd love to have him here, but I just count myself blessed to be able to fill in in his absence and just trusting that God will use this time greatly in our lives. Of course, the center of our attention has been on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15 really does deal with that subject in an intense fashion and in a great way. And when you think of certain chapters in the Bible, uh, you think of the charity chapter or the love chapter. It's 1 Corinthians 13. And when you think of the Word of God, you go to Psalm 119 and just realizing that there are certain passages in the Word of God that handle subject matters in a very uh, wonderfully and enlightening manner. I, I, my mind goes to 1 John chapter 4 and just talking about the love of God. And so I'm always intent on those passages that handle a subject matter. And so, of course, as I thought on the resurrection, my mind went to 1 Corinthians 15. And I want to read the first 26 verses and then preach a message which I entitle, The Resurrection is Real. And so I invite you to follow along in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, after that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen... Then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Now, but now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came uh, death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Amen. Now that passage goes on, but I want to focus our attention on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is recorded in the Gospels, in the Scriptures, in Matthew chapter 28, in Mark chapter 16, in Luke 24, as well as John chapter 20. And I would encourage you that in today or in your quiet time this afternoon, if you 
you know, have the uh, meal or whatever you have, then to be able to spend some time in those passages and meditate on and read the record of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I assure you, if you know Christ, it'll encourage you. And if you don't know Christ, it'll be another element of revealing His great love toward you and the fact that He wants to give you eternal life. And so, this is a tremendous portion of Scripture. And the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, it should be a cause of joy and adoration and celebration for every single believer. It is something that we look at and we just marvel at the power of God and the ability of Him to impart life to those who are spiritually dead. And as a believer, we rejoice in that. When I think of the resurrection, and I trust that you do as well, you realize that because of His power to overcome death and the grave and our spiritual inability, our, our spiritual death, He was able to impart life as, as we put our faith and trust in Him, he can provide eternal life for each and every one of us because of His ability, because of His resurrection. And that is a source of joy. You know, when I think on 1 Corinthians 15, it does describe the resurrection of Christ, but it also goes on to describe our resurrection. We're not going to read it, but I encourage you to do it. Verses 35 to the end of the chapter really deal with our resurrection and our bodily resurrection. And I like to think on that, and you've probably heard me say it before, that when I get to heaven and I receive, like the Apostle Paul says, my new body, that glorified body, that it's going to be taller, stronger, all of those elements uh, when I get to glory. I'd like to be just over six feet. I don't know if that's, you know, something that's possible. The Lord can do anything He chooses to do. And so, but I know that I'm going to receive a glorified body. In 1 John chapter 3, we talk about the love of God. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. But it goes on in that passage to say that when we see Him, five powerful words, we shall be like Him. And as I think on that, I just go, wow, the resurrection of Christ provides for me a resurrection. And in that sense, I get a new body, one that's going to last for all eternity, and I will be like Him. Now, I like thinking on that, yes, in glory, but to realize that He's doing that perfecting work in me now. He actually wants me to be like Christ now as well. So I love just thinking on the resurrection and what it means to me. So as I thought on that, the Bible is our resource for studying this resurrection. You know, unlike creation... We can take a look at creation and all that God has made. In Psalm 19, the Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God. And so we can examine it, and scientifically we can study it. And what it does is really confirm. Any true science is going to confirm what God has already said about His creation. And it's a marvelous thing to look at and to learn. And God has given us some information on it, not all, but then as we delve into those sciences and we study God's creation, it just again exalts God and His glory and His majesty and His power and His might. And so that's, that's a wonderful thing to do. But when we think on the resurre uh, resurrection, it's unlike studying creation. It's unlike the body. I mean, we can study the human body and praise the Lord for physicians and individuals that are excellent at you know, discerning what's wrong with a body. I think about Pastor Sullivan in the hospital and how they can actually go into an artery through the arm and place a tube inside of a, an artery close to the heart and expand it so the blood can flow again. That's incredible. And I know he's waiting on one now and we ought to pray for, you know, St. Boniface to give him a call and bring him in there and do that stint and so that the blood can continue to flow and, and he can renew that strength and all of those things. And to recognize, folks, my, my dad has been through that procedure many times. And that's God's grace in providing him that life and continued life. And I thank God for it. And just think about the medical marvels that we see on a daily basis. This is on a daily basis. And we can study those things. And again, what it does is confirm what God has done and said in his word about how he created us. I think about, you know, the book of Proverbs 17, verse 22. It says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, 
but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Medically, laughter is good for you. Lower stress levels. It's just good for you. And I love to laugh. Um, it, it just, it does something in our bodies. But God said that long before we had heart monitors to register that laughter actually helped lower those stress levels. God knew that because he made us. And we can study these things. But when it comes to the resurrection, we have to go to the scriptures to study these things. Because you realize, unlike the disciples, I wasn't there. You know, I wasn't in the garden when they looked into the tomb and it was, it was empty. And, and they're like, hey, where'd they go? And you had Mary. And, and she's wondering, you know, to the gardener, who was Jesus, to the gardener, where have you laid him? I'll go get him. She was looking for a body. There was no body. He was resurrected. Amen. He lives, amen? Yes. But I wasn't there to study it. And I think about 1 John chapter 1, and the Bible says that the disciples handled the word of life. I mean, they laid their hands on him. And they were able to fellowship with him and to commune with him and to eat with him in his resurrected body. I mean, there he was, just showed up in the room. The door's all locked. And so they were able to have a better insight into that resurrected body of the Lord Jesus Christ than I do, though how much they really understood, I don't know. But I just think on that and how we don't have the same resources to study the resurrected body as we do creation or the human body. But it is just as real. Amen. And praise God for it. Yeah. You know, you think about Lazarus, who um, he may have a better idea. You know, when I think on that, it's, it's one of those where you think, okay, Lord, what did you do with Lazarus for those days that he was in the grave? Did he actually, you know, was he up in glory or, or, or did you keep him in some kind of, you know, uh, spot where he didn't really have a glimpse so that he, he came back? It'd be a little tough to think about coming back after being in glory, amen? And yet there he was and, you know, he understood the resurrection in another sense. But you and I, when we go to the Bible, we have this tremendous resource that we can look at and examine and think on and meditate on in relation to the resurrection of Christ as well as our resurrection. And so in the time that we have today, I want us to think on 1 Corinthians 15 and what do we know about the resurrection and understanding that it all culminates in the fact that the resurrection is real. The resurrection, I tell you, is vital to the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, if you have ever been in any of my classes or if you've heard me preach on the gospel before, I say that if you're looking for a Bible definition of the gospel, you need go nowhere else than 1 Corinthians 15. Now you can go other places, but 1 Corinthians 15, we have a definition of the gospel, which means glad tidings. The Bible says, and Paul writing, I, delivered, uh, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Verse 3 says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. When you think on the glad tidings, it involves the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this week, many of us have spent time meditating on, perhaps reading through the, the accounts in the Gospels of the crucifixion. We had in our Sunday school hour an opportunity to think on the broken body and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have it recorded in the Gospels. But realizing that the death of the Lord Jesus Christ was vital to those glad tidings. Without it, we have no hope. It was His blood that was shed on Calvary. It was His broken body that was sufficient. And as we prayed in the prayer room before, someone prayed about the propitiation of the blood of Jesus Christ. That means that God was satisfied when Jesus Christ shed His blood. That lamb, that spotless lamb from the foundation of the world, God was satisfied with that sacrifice for the atonement of sins. Wow! But that doesn't happen without the death. So the death is vital to the gospel, and we have it recorded. The burial was to fulfill the scriptures and praise God for the resurrection, that triumph over sin and the devil and the grave. 
In 1 Corinthians 15, if you get to the end of the chapter, the Bible says in verse 55, actually back up to verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Those glad tidings would not be glad tidings without those three elements. The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Death is swallowed up in victory. Praise God. Amen. We live in a time where folks are just fearful. Fearful for the last number of years. And they're fearful of what? Primarily death. Death. They just have no concept of what happens after that. Folks, you and I, because of the resurrection of Christ, we have complete knowledge in that sense. Not complete in that we'll, we'll understand every element. Like, will I be six foot two? I don't know. But I know the resurrection is real. Because he is risen from the dead. I will be risen. Amen. That truth is real. And it took all of those elements in Hebrews. And I invite you to go to the book of Hebrews, if you will. And again, there are so many passages and just, you know, illustrations and things that we can examine. In Hebrews chapter 2, we won't delve into all of them. But as I think on the resurrection of Christ and how it applies to me, I thank God for it. In Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, the Bible says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also. Now, I'll give you just a little bit of background. This is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, where it says, He also. Talking about Christ and dealing with him becoming flesh. The God man. Uh, you know, completely man, completely God. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took on him the nature of angels, but he, uh, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. He is able to draw us because of who he is. And that resurrection that we read about of the Lord Jesus Christ destroyed annihilated the power of death and the grave and the devil. Amen? Amen? What a cause, what a source of rejoicing for you and I. The glad tidings, the good news, the gospel. The resurrection is vital to that truly being good news. Now, preaching the gospel without the resurrection is vain. 1 Corinthians 15, once again, the Bible says in verse 14 of that passage of Scripture... And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Think about that statement. What I'm doing here this morning, if Christ is not alive, is vain. Vain means empty. It would be pointless, completely pointless, to gather here and listen to a five foot six and a half, I used to be five seven, five foot six and a half prairie boy preaching on the resurrection if Christ wasn't alive. That would be empty. You would have wasted your time. But praise God, it's not a waste of time. It is a tremendous source of joy and peace and comfort for you and I who know Christ. And so as you think on preaching the gospel, Paul says it'd be vain. And your faith would be vain. Empty without that resurrection. Bible says that we would be false witnesses of Christ in verse 15. That would be giving a false hope. Folks, that would be tragic. Tragic to think, I've given my life and you have as well to tell others about the wonderful good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And can you imagine if that wasn't real? Think of the people that you have passed gospel tracts to. 
Think of the people that you have opened your Bible and shared with them the plan of salvation. Think of the little boys and girls at VBS that you've talked to about the Lord Jesus. Think about those that you encounter from day to day and you tell them your testimony about trusting Christ as their Savior, as your Savior. That would be vain without the resurrection. But praise God, I say once again, it is not vain. It is the glorious hope that we have. And this season, we rejoice in that. We remember it. So preaching that gospel is a tremendous source of joy and power. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us that are saved it is the power of God. It's Christ that has the power to give you eternal life. It is Christ that has the power to give you new life. It is Christ because of His power that can make you like Him. I don't have that power. You don't have that power. He does. And in the resurrection, He displayed that power. As we think on His ability to come forth out of the grave, no tomb could hold Him. And He says, I'll give you new life. And we are assured of that because of what He has said. Without the resurrection, your faith is vain. If Christ is dead, the Bible says you are yet in your sins. And I think about those that engage Jesus from time to time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And you've heard before, the Sadducees are sad because they don't believe in the resurrection. And you have Paul here writing on that very subject. And he says that if you don't believe in the resurrection, your faith is vain. And you are of all men most miserable. That would be a miserable existence to think that this is it. This is it. Whatever hardships, trials, and turmoils you go through, this is it. But this isn't it. This isn't it. Our hope is an eternal resurrection where you and I will spend all eternity with God. You can go to John 14 and think on the mansion that he's, that's awaiting you in glory. You can think of all the promises that we have in 1 and 2 Thessalonians about his return and taking us to be with him. All of those thoughts should bring us joy. Because the resurrection is real. It's real. Christ's resurrection, your resurrection, if you know him, is real. I say this, the resurrection is valiantly declared. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20, you have Paul who says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Think on his life. Paul declared the gospel, the glad tidings, to whomever and whoever would listen. And it's amazing to me when I think on by that one, Paul, many came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Amen. And he had no problem declaring that Jesus Christ was alive. Alive. Under the threat of death. How many times did he face death because of it? I mean, in cities he would go in and declare the gospel. And at times they would pull him outside the city and stone him. At times they had him cast into prison. He was beaten. Shipwrecked. Why? Because he believed in a risen Savior. And he wanted to get that message across the world. He wanted everybody to know. So the threat of death did not stop him from saying Jesus is alive, nor should it do you and I, because we believe in a risen Savior. You know, he staked his own life on it and the life of others on it. He taught others to trust in a risen Savior. It's exactly what we do. I have no ability to save anyone. Christ does. But I tell them of a risen Christ. I tell them of a risen Savior. I tell them to put their faith in Christ, just as Paul did. He is the only hope for mankind. Christ is. Paul declared that message, and he declared it valiantly. I mean, under the threat of death and imprisonment, those things didn't faze him, nor should it you and I. If we truly believe in a risen Savior, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 1, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. For me to live is Christ, he said, and to die is gain. Now, that doesn't mean I'm in a hurry to leave. This. I have a good life, amen. I have a loving family, a great church. I, God has been so good to me and giving me life. Colossians says that he is my life. And in that sense, I love my life. But I also recognize the truth that to leave this world 
is to be with my Savior Amen. forever in a glorified body. That's a pretty good truth. To find my home in heaven, to see my mansion in real, because the resurrection is real, the mansion is real, heaven is real. That also means hell is real. And those that reject Christ, that's where they go. Not that God wants them to go there, but that's the truth. Oh, we think on the resurrection and just it's valiantly declared. Now we do see the resurrection. And I will say this, in studying it, you can see it in nature. You know, even in 1 Corinthians 15, I'll uh, just give you the references, but in verses 35 through 44, you do have an illustration. And, and uh, farmers understand this. Those that plant gardens, those that put seeds in understand this. You put a grain into the ground and you realize that it's dead, but it brings forth. And that grain bears fruit. And you realize, though, first comes death. This is inevitable. The Bible declares it. Hebrews chapter 9, and verse 27. As it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. So the natural body, sown into the ground. Just like a kernel of corn, if you will. And that's the illustration we have of grain. You sow that, that seed into the ground, and it brings forth. And you think on corn and just the cob. You know, that, that the new exceeds the old by so much. It's hard to really fathom, but we can think on it in nature. We can think on that resurrection and the, the illustration. You just realize that the new is just so much better than the old. The new. I mean, I, I talk about my home here. You know, my wife and I, we, we're very grateful for the home that we have. But folks, I got a mansion, my new home, awaiting me in glory, and it's far better. I, I, I used to use, there was in, in Ontario where we lived, on one of the roads, there was uh, uh, the McLaughlin place. They had a huge place. I mean, the front yard had ponds in it, and they had cattle grazing in the front yard and gates that went all the way around. Their guest house was bigger than our place. I mean, it was just amazing. And I used to say that that would be my garden shed and glory. It's like, I got a mansion, and I need a garden shed, so I'll use something kind of like the McLaughlin place. I use that kind of jokingly, but then I actually, in Toronto, went to Casa Loma. If you've ever been to Casa Loma, I started using that and said, hey, I got a mansion in glory, and so I need a garden shed. I'll use something like Casa Loma as my garden shed. It's a giant castle. I mean, just room after room after room. I like thinking like that because the new is so much better than the old. So much better. This body, I'm grateful for the strength and health that I have. I'm in my 50s now. I know for some, that's not too old, but some, you're going, oh, he's old. I know. When you're 12, <laughs> I understand. But do you know this body, I'm going to get a new one. A new one that doesn't fade away, that will last for all eternity, likened unto his glorious body, the Bible says. The new is just so much better than the old. So much better because of the resurrection. It is visible in nature. We can't study the resurrected body in the sense, but we can see it illustrated in nature. And God is going to do that wonderful work of giving us the new. We ought to think on that. The resurrection, it's viewed by faith. How can I know that Christ is risen? We sang the song, you know, Christ is risen. How do you know that? Because he lives in me. New life. It has always taken faith. Always taken faith to believe in Jesus Christ. The Bible is filled with it. Whether you go to John chapter 3 and Nicodemus saying how, you know, the, the, the whole idea of the new birth. Can I enter into my mother's womb the second time and be born again? And Jesus said, oh, oh no, but you do need to be born again. And it's a spiritual birth. And he explained it to him. And as we think on those things, it is real. Faith in Christ provides that new life, that new birth. And faith in God provides that new home and that new place in heaven, just as he promised. It is faith that 1 Corinthians is accurate about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of his resurrection, I have life. If you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can have life eternal in him. Because he is alive you can be alive. I'd encourage you to spend some time in Romans 6, 7, and 8 
If you, if you need encouragement on that level, uh, on that topic of being in Christ and having life in Him, and eternal life in Him, John chapter 10, Romans 6, 7, 8, um, 1 John, so many portions of Scripture that just tremendously deal with that subject. It's undeniable. Undeniable. Well, I should rephrase that. Some deny it. But they deny what the Scriptures have to say about it. That's vain. Faith. The resurrection is always viewed by faith. Folks, I wasn't there at the tomb. I, I wasn't running with the disciples, and I wasn't there in the room when Jesus came through the walls or however He appeared. I wasn't there when He made the fish on the seashore. Um, I wasn't there, you know, on the mount when they, you know, they saw Jesus taken up and into the clouds, and the angels said, Why gaze ye up into heaven? This same Jesus shall so come in like manner. I wasn't there, so I can't study that. But I can study what the Scriptures have to say about Jesus Christ. I can take a look at 1 Corinthians 15 and realize that Jesus Christ is alive. And because He's alive, I can have life in Him. And all it takes is faith. Faith in what God has said about eternal life, about Jesus Christ, and believing in Him. Folks, it's, it's a marvel to me that anybody would say no, but some do. But I trust you won't. And that if you don't know Christ as your Savior, today would be the day of your salvation. And if you're a believer, thinking on the resurrection of Christ would be a source of joy for you. And motivation to tell others. Tell others about Jesus Christ and the life they can have in Him. Amen? Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I entitled the message, The Resurrection is Real. And it's real because God said so. You and I read the gospel accounts and we read about the crucifixion, Jesus Christ dying, being buried, and rising again on the third day, just as he said he would, that's real. And those who put their faith and trust in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, whosoever shall call upon my name, they'll be saved. What a great truth. As the musicians play, if you need to come, and if you're here without Christ, please, please come down let one of these men take the scriptures and show you the way of salvation. If you've never accepted the wonderful gift of eternal life, oh, what a season this would be. Easter, the Resurrection Sunday, to be given life by God because of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, folks. The resurrection is real. As you and I engage in life and at times the trials and tribulations, our hope is in God. That He will at the last trump? Or should He tarry and we perish in this life? Well, the Bible says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul had a great desire to depart and to be with Christ, which he said in Philippians chapter 1 was far better. Knowing Christ and His resurrection and the ability to raise you and I is far better. When we preach Christ and Him risen from the grave. Dead for our sins, risen from the grave. It's the glorious hope that we have then you and I have an opportunity to tell others.